Love Talk Radio. Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim GK. Sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of the Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of the Core Business Show, Tim Jacquet. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Core Business Show. This is Tim Jacquet, your host. Today, I have the pleasure of having Melinda Henson Neely, she's going to talk about her book, her second book, Eat In, Not Out, the Learn How to Cook book with our recipes. If you have any questions, go ahead and post your questions in the chat room, or you can call us at 347-324-346. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I guess to begin with, kind of tell us about yourself. Our audience like to get a personal view versus reading a us reading a bio, but tell us about yourself. Okay, well, I'm a native Southerner, born and raised in Tennessee, and I was a little bit of a health nut even as a small child because I started running when I was in the seventh grade. But when I went off to college, I decided with my skill set of math and science, it was either, okay, I'll be a doctor or an engineer, which will it be? And I chose uh, the pre-med route in college and decided to major in nutrition. And when I got out of college, though, I changed my mind about going to medical school, went back and got my MBA and spent a career in marketing, both working for packaged goods manufacturers, and then I ran my own business and still do marketing consulting on my own. So, mm-hmm. but I've kind of come full circle with these books on health and wellness. So, wow, this is a great inspiration. Kind of tell us about when you mentioned you're uh, been in the seventh grade. What prompted you to start running and start talking about health and mainly going around that track? Well, that's health, a really you know, good question. Track. My, oh, go ahead. But it's funny, I had a, my, my history teacher was the track coach and he just threw out there one day, why don't you start running? And I did. And then I came back like a couple months later and said, well, I've been running. I don't think you believe me. <laughs> and then I'm like, well, I really <laughs> did. <laughs> and, and so it kind of went from there and I just, I kind of enjoyed it. I was a little bit introverted at that age and it was something for me to kind of embark on that gave me confidence and it just, it kind of made me feel good about myself and made me feel good. So. This is your second book, and the first book and from the second book, can I tell us the difference between those two books, and how did you come out with the title for the second book? Okay. Well, the first, my first book is called Finding Life's Secret Sauce, and it's mm-hmm. really kind of my overall theory on health and wellness and how you put the little pieces together of eating well and fitness and other life adventures, even despite your busy schedule. What are some secrets to maintain a healthy life? And then... From there, I really kind of harken back to the, for my second book, I harken back to the first book because I think a lot of times eating well specifically starts by cooking food for yourself. And because if you don't, if somebody's always making food for you, you really never know what you're eating. So that, that inspired the second book and it really does promote eating at home versus eating out. What do you think the challenge is? I know families are busy today and it's easier to go by McDonald's and Burger King and so forth and grab a burger or a happy meal for your child. But how, when you actually sit there and line everything out, how can a person mentally put themselves that they really need to cook besides the health benefits of that, but also the preparation? How can a person plan that whole week of meals mentally? Because it's not just the physical part of it, it's the mental part. Yeah, I mean, you kind of gave me the answer in your question, and that really goes back to planning. And and I'll be the first to admit I'm not the world's best planner, but if I know I've got three tennis matches in a given week, then I know I have to do something in advance, whether it's making meals ahead of time or or making meals that just don't take much prep time to pull together so that people can eat before the family's gone for the night. And it can be very challenging. And sometimes it may come down to, okay, well, all we have time to do now is drink a protein shake and we'll eat dinner when we get back home. But there are a number of things that are quick and easy to make. And then, of course, you can always make meals ahead of time, too. How a person can make them, what should they make that's going to be really easy? You can always put uh, carrots and things like that together. But I think it's twofold. When you have dealing with kids, you got to make it fun and inviting. Uh, I think that's what the challenges the schools really have today. When I was teaching, 
We start to have hamburgers, but not what they have today. They have a hodgepodge of you name it. It, It's a dream. I mean, kids look forward to lunch. (laughs) We didn't look forward to lunch. Okay, that's giving us a break. But we didn't never had we didn't have pizza and hamburgers and all this other stuff that oh my gosh I just can't wait to have some Doritos or something like that and that's what they have today. How can you pull a child from that? I do. Th- I mean, at this point, it, it is challenging, and I'm actually working on a funny blog post about people making fun of me because I don't let my child go to McDonald's. But I think there are going to be times when you just have to accept what is and not worry about it. Um, but But then there are other occasions. I mean, I think by with my child specifically, by feeding him healthy foods at night, he tends not to want the junk food at lunch. So, I mean, I think you develop this sort of repertoire for healthy food if indeed that's what you're eating. And on the flip side, if you're eating French fries and McDonald's McNuggets every day, I think you develop an affinity for fatty foods. So I think it's you can really develop your palate to like certain things or not. What type of foods are those? I mean, some people know, some people don't. Kind of tell us what are healthy foods? I just think at the end of the day, when you look at healthy whole foods, something that's come straight from the earth, it's hard to beat that, whether it's a fruit or a vegetable. Anything that you can pick from the ground and eat is the healthiest thing you're going to probably put in your body. And I know a lot of people like chicken, fish, and beef. And if you can take more sustainably grown meats, you can throw those into the mix of the healthy whole foods. But I think that certainly is the best way to go if you're looking to eat well. Okay. And your opinion when it comes to dealing with beef and chicken and fish, well, are they going to be in the same category or are they really you just well, need to stick with the plant? I, despite the fact that everybody thinks I'm a vegetarian, I'm not. And, and I think, again, it's about eating things in moderation. I, I eat beef. I only like certain kinds of beef, but I try to pick foods that are more sustainably grown from local farms or organic foods when I can afford them. I mean, just like everyone else, you can't, I can't always afford them. And same with chicken. And then I'm very partial to fish. I could probably eat fish every night, but my family doesn't want fish every night. So, so again, we just kind of have a variety. And then I sneak in vegetarian meals when I can at night. So um, I think by having that variety that we kind of eat a little bit of everything in moderation. There was something on television a few years back regarding a lot of uh, recipes that were available on the internet that uh, for carrots you can have incorporated into this particular dish, but there's some, some of them are dessert, some of them are just regular meals, but the, so kids would know exactly what they're eating. It's a regular potatoes go to sweet potatoes. Anything that, in your opinion, in your books, that kind of disguise food, you still get the healthy nutrition and the taste, but is disguised in a different way for your child? Well, it's funny. I, I tend not to disguise food because I feel like if I continue to disguise food, he's never going to really know what he's eating. But okay. on the flip side, I've made some foods. For example, I'll make a tofu enchiladas or and I've made ve- veggie burgers of different types of veggie burgers. And I've made eggplant parmesan. And those are just a few examples where when I serve them, he'll first turn to me and say, oh, mom, I love the meat. So he's not even aware that he's <laughs> eating the meat alternative. So, and I'm not actually trying to hide it from him, but he just hasn't figured that out. So, Yeah, that's, they're getting pretty good on these veggie burgers. So do you make yours from scratch or you just buy them? I do make them from scratch, and it depends on what else I'm cooking that week. If I cook something with black beans, I'll make black bean veggie burgers. Or if I'm making something with black eyed peas, I'll make black eyed pea veggie burgers. So it kind of depends on what I've got in my house. But I have discovered that the homemade veggie burgers are about 100 times better than the ones you buy. So how can you make a veggie burger from home? Take whatever kind of bean you kind of a bean base and then you tend to add some sort of grain, whether it's rice or maybe it's a bread base. And then generally there's different herbs and it's kind of the same basic combination of ingredients. Some of the grain with the bean with something wet to hold it together and some flavor, and then you add the flavor to it. And they're really, really delicious. Wow. So just simple beans and grains and then all something, do you use like an egg or something to kind of hold it together or... Yeah, yeah, eggs, eggs kind of keep it wet and hold it together. And then sometimes you can add like a cornmeal to it. Again, all these things just to add some substance. And then a lot of times I'll sneak in some red peppers and some other 
healthy little vegetables too. So, you know, all depending on what I've got in my fridge, basically. Well, any other type of thing that people normally carry in their refrigerator, they're always going to carry in most cases eggs, milk, flour. Should the person get the wheat flour or to get away from that whole flour or? I think it is healthier to eat the wheat flour, but, you know, I have both because there are certain things that I make that the wheat flavor, the texture is somewhat different than the white flour. And sometimes I'll do a combination of the two. And, you know, like I said, I'm a believer in moderation and I do make my fair share of sweets. And, and sometimes the white flour is better when you're baking. Okay. What's common a person on the cap carry in the refrigerator that, hey, you can pull something together? Or what, or what basic items that a person should always have that they can mm-hmm. make something at any time? I think we do. You mentioned quite a few of the dairy products, the milk, eggs, cheese, some of the dairy items. And then I, I have a whole host of vegetables sitting in my fridge and tortillas. And you can almost always throw something together with a bunch of veggies. And, and whether you're using those veggies with tortillas or rice or whatever, that's always a good easy meal too. So those are, and then I generally have some plain yogurt because I tend to use yogurt in a lot of different things as well. And it usually has some tofu in the fridge. And but that's kind of, that kind of rounds out, I think the basic ingredients I generally have in my fridge. Okay. And when it comes to, do you have like your own garden that you plant and harvest from that? I do. Although ironically, I just moved into a new house and we moved kind of in the awkward season when you needed to start planting all your food. So, so this summer, I'm just going to have to live with anything I can put in a container. And then next year, we'll get back to our usual, you know, what usual veggie garden. But you do, it does have, it does vary all depending on where you live and what you can grow. So. And what type of items do you normally grow in your yard and when should you be planting? Well, it all depends on where you live because in the South, you could you can plant earlier than earlier in the year than here. They they advise in the I live in Boise, Idaho. You know that if there's still snow in the mountains next to the town, it's too soon to plant anything because you might get another frost, which would ruin everything you've just planted. But I generally I try to grow things that are kind of expensive at the store but easy to grow at home, and that includes mm-hmm. everything from different types of lettuces and spinach and tomatoes and that sort of thing. I know I've grown things like broccoli and cabbage, but I didn't really feel like it tasted a lot better than what I bought at the market. And it's no, not a lot less expensive either. So I tend to do it by expense as well as by what grows well. Okay. So you're taking into account, okay, how much is going to cost for me to go ahead and plant and harvest and so forth. Is it really easy to just go to your local farmer's market or go to a seed store and just grab these seeds like broccoli and just do your whole garden that way and watch them grow or sense of, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I do it both. I, sometimes I take the seed and germinate them inside before I plant them. And then sometimes I plant the seeds directly in the garden. And then other times if I'm running late or I just decide I want to add something new, I might even just go to Home Depot and buy something that's already growing and planted. So I kind of do all three. Anything to use for a fertilizer? I do use, you know, I go to my local, we have a local kind of organic gardening store and I'm like, okay, what do I buy? (laughs) And I just, I get whatever they tell me to get. So yeah, I do use a fertilizer. Okay. Anything you use to keep the bugs off? I have not been using anything to keep the bugs off, but the climate here is not too buggy. So I've been okay with that. But again, I know that does vary by climate. Yeah. Especially in the South. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. A few more bugs there than here. (laughs) Yeah, you're going to be having a whole meal there for them. I'm going to take a break real quick and we'll be back in a moment with, with Melinda Neely talking about her book, Eat In and Not Out. Be back in a moment. You're listening to The Core Business Show, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. Apple Capital Group in Jacksonville, Florida, is a commercial lender that specializes in asset-based loans, equipment leasing and financing, invoice financing, commercial real estate loans, and asset-based financing in the U.S. and Canada. Apple Capital Group is a direct lender that lends on their private equity investment portfolio. 90% of most loans are decided within two hours, and vendor funding within 24 hours after documents are completed with a one-page application. No slow no's, just a quick decision and a fast yes. 
To get more information about lending from Apple Capital Group, call 866-611-7457. That's 866-611-7457 to speak with one of our loan specialists. Or visit us right now at AppleCapitalGroup.com. Welcome back to The Core. Once again, here's Kim Jatang. Okay, we're back. I guess let's talk about health and nutrition. Tell us about when it comes to nutrition, do you believe in diving for weight loss? I, I actually don't. And I say that because when I went off to college, I gained my healthy 25 pounds. And I obsessed over calories and diet to try to drop the weight I gained. And it really wasn't until I completely changed my habits and just started eating better that I actually lost the weight and cut it off. And and ever since then, I've just had that inner mantra that is like, just eat in moderation. I mean, you don't have to deprive yourself from things you love. Um, you just have to not eat a whole pie, you just eat a piece of the pie. And, <laughs> and you know, I think if you go with that approach, you know, you'll be okay in the end. So, Well, it's kind of amazing because really people are addicted to certain processed food. I mean, you, if, if you really love cake, I mean, you just can't stop at one cupcake when you go to Sprinkles. You're going to have to have maybe another one. And when we have three of them, then you say, oh, my gosh, I really should have just had one. But it's like it's an addiction on certain things. But once you you get it and then you gorge on it, then all of a sudden now you're sick. And you, it, it's kind of a strange type of thing, but it's an addiction. And that's the thing when you're talking about really dieting. How can you control that eat in moderation? I think once you, if you don't eat it and you train your body a certain way, then it's easier to go to your sprinkles cupcake and eat a half a cupcake. But it's like you <laughs> got to set yourself up first, and you and like you have to go through this withdrawal for a week, and then things taper off, and then you just don't have the need, then you can go just eat half. What is your opinion on that? Well, it's like I the jump think, start. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right to a certain degree, especially with sweets, because I think there are people do have an addiction to sugary things. And if you can cut down or cut out, even for a brief duration of time, I think you can sort of gradually wean them back in your diet without having an obsession over them. But on the flip side, I mean, I really love kettle chips, the uh, salt and vinegar potato chips. And I've trained myself to buy a package and like see how long I can make the package last in my cabinet with, so that I'm not <laughs> eating the whole thing when I sit down and, and really practice that discipline. So I think it's a combination of both. I mean, I think some people do need to cut it out completely and then maybe gradually add it back in. Or you can, on the flip side, try to train yourself to just have one cookie instead of three or one sprinkle cupcake. I had my first sprinkle cupcake last summer, so I know how good they are. Yeah, to just have the one instead of having three. Because I think it's a matter of discipline. And I think the other thing, too, is making sure you're eating healthy foods before you eat that addicted item. Because if you just had a really healthy dinner and you went out to exercise that day, it definitely reduces that need for the third cupcake because you're already feeling good and you're full and, and you just don't have the need as much, I don't think. Well, what about, what are the top three most important tips for healthy eating? Well, I have to say this one, which is eat in and not out because it's the title of my book. <laughs> but I think... <laughs> Obviously, you're going to have to eat out sometimes, and you're going to want to eat out sometimes. But the more you can make healthy whole food, whole meals at home, the better off you're going to be. Um, and then just and do try to adhere as much as you can to eating those plant-based, homegrown foods and organic meats and whatnot versus eating processed foods because that's kind of where you enter the danger zone when you enter when you eat the processed foods. And then I think lastly. A trick that's kind of worked nicely for me is to just eat balanced meals. You're supposed to have carbohydrates, proteins, and healthy fats. So it, without going to the trouble of counting the grams of everything, just to make sure you get a little bit of each when you're eating your meals, and then that helps you incorporate more balance in your diet. In elementary school, you're taught what to eat, those four major groups, but somehow it, as you grow older, I guess as a teenager, you burn a a lot of fat and so forth. So you really, a lot of people don't have that, that problem unless they do eat out a lot. But what are the the healthy ingredients that you should be eating? The four major groups that I've heard of, but they just haven't comprehended yet. Can you share that with us? Yeah, I mean, I think the first of these is carbohydrates. And I know there are a lot of diets 
there are a lot of diets out there that will tell you not to eat carbohydrates and then others that will tell you not to eat fat at all. But I think good carbohydrates, not sugar, not white sugar, but good healthy carbohydrates, a certain percentage of those as well as protein because protein gives you energy. It helps control your metabolism. The third thing are those healthy fats. Again, not vegetable oil, but nuts and avocados and, and, the, and salmon has a health, healthy fat. And then the fourth kind of category is dietary fiber to help prevent disease. So those are the four that, again, it's not, and I know it gets confusing because even the USDA changes what percentage of what we're supposed to eat. So that's why I feel like if you kind of have a, a healthy balance of each, then you don't have to worry so much about what the USD recommendations at the time are. Okay. And when it comes to eating out, if you're looking at a menu and you're at Denny's, what should you gravitate, especially when it comes to holidays and you're traveling, you you have to go to these places if you're traveling, just can't cook. What should you be looking at if you go to IHOP or Denny's on the plate, on your menu? <laughs> well, I yeah, I think, first of all, I just read an article about this yesterday too, but watch the appetizer selection because a lot of times a lot of the appetizers aren't the healthiest selections on the menu. Um, try mm -hmm. to stay away from creamy sauces like Alfredo sauces because generally if you opt for like a red sauce, that's vegetable-based and healthier. And the article I read yesterday said if you're choosing the soup of the day, to use a broth-based soup instead of a cream-based soup. It's cream-based soup because okay. it's better for you and it fills you up. And then, of course, you could steer away from the French fries, which is hard to do in Idaho because they know how to make their French fries here. <laughs> <laughs> and what about sweet potato pies? I mean, sweet potato fries, is that a good alternative? Well, that's, my, really... that's another one of my bad addictions because I love sweet potato fries and I tell myself that they are healthier. <laughs> but And I think they probably are <laughs> healthier than just regular because sweet potatoes do have more nutrients than regular rusted potatoes or baked potatoes. I think anything mm -hmm. fried is probably a bad option, but still, sweet potatoes in general have more nutrients. Okay, so if they want to do sweet potato fries and want to make their own, and they can grow their own sweet potatoes, how what they should be? Should they bake them, or and what yeah. can you put on them to yeah. bake them? And, and or if you fry them, what can you fry them in? Well, you know what? I have never fried sweet potatoes at home, so I don't even know the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> because I oh, think okay. you really do. I think you have to deep fry them to cook them properly. But if you bake them and put olive oil on the top and salt and pepper, and sometimes we add other herbs or seasonings and bake them for about 30 minutes on 400, you won't miss the fried version. They're just, they're delicious. So Is that a crunch up on the outside? They do. And that's why I, when I bake them at home, I turn up the heat higher than what I guess it's a common baking temperature is 350, so I turn it up higher because that kind of mm -hmm. gets the outside a bit more crisp. Okay, great. And uh, on fitness, it's really hard to get a person to work out. How can you do that mentally to get a person to just walk and be mobile, not to run a marathon, but to be a little bit more active around the house? Yeah, I think it's taking baby steps and not no, not starting out thinking you you do, like you just said, not that you have to go out and run a marathon, right, from day one. To just start little and maybe start with 10 minutes a day walking around the block. Or So I think it starts small. Forgive yourself if you skip it a day. And then really find something you love doing because if you hate walking or you hate running, you're far less likely to get out there and do it. And there are plenty of other things that you can choose from, everything from yoga to tennis to biking to basketball to soccer. There's so many things out there for a person to try these days. It's bound to be something you'll like. And then it'll be much easier to fit it in your schedule and make it a habit from then on. How do you balance stress with all of this eating? Because some people are emotionally eaters and they would just eat for the emotional addiction because it makes them feel better. Is there any other type of thing they can do or foods that they can eat that kind of can combat stress or they can eat that won't be so fattening? Yeah, I think the afternoon munchies are good, whether it's emotional eating or whether you're genuinely hungry in the afternoon, is to really seek some of those healthier snacks so that they're at your disposal when you have those moments, whether it's fruit or vegetables and hummus or some nuts even, just something to reach out to that is healthier. And then I think to have other avenues to pour 
our stress into, whether it's exercise or something creative, or maybe it's meditation or, or whatever it is, but to have some other outlet to control stress versus always just turning to food. Okay. When you actually wrote your book, your first, second book, how did you go to the point of having it published? Did you go out to solicit to publishers or how did you actually get your book published? Well, it's funny because at the time I wrote the book, it was about the time of the recession and I was like, oh, I'm going to write a marketing book and use this to, to build my business back because it had been, we've been having issues during the recession period. But instead, mm-hmm. I just decided to write about what I felt passionate about in life, which is health and wellness. So I wrote the book in about three months and I, my first book, I went to what's called a hybrid publisher, Morgan James Publishing. I sent them the book and they accepted it like two weeks later and it was in print soon after that. So my whole first book publishing experience was fairly seamless, but I I didn't go the traditional way of finding an agent and then picking all the big New York, pitching all the big New York publishing houses because that would have taken considerably longer. And And then with my uh, second, yeah, with my, sorry, go ahead. And my second book, I, I'm actually working with a Seattle based publisher called Book Trope. And I had met one of the employees of Book Trope in person, and that's kind of how that relationship got started. Okay, wow. So in that experience, do you go do book signings, or how do you actually promote your book, or they do everything? Nobody does everything for you. So do, unless maybe you're <laughs> a, a Sue E.L. James or somebody else really famous. So yeah, I think it's, I don't do a lot of book signings because I think that method is actually becoming a little bit uh less popular because of all the social media we have now. It's just not as necessary to get out and sign books in person, though I still like doing it. So it's a combination Mm -hmm. of doing things online, writing guest blogs, doing speaking. I've done some speaking engagements and getting on shows like yours today and kind of a combination of all that stuff to market the book. Wow. And do you have to get a publicist or a business manager to help you or you just manage everything yourself? Well, you can get a, a publicist, but that does that will come out of the author's pocket to hire a publicist. I think again, unless mm-hmm. you are one of those top, you know, point five percent upper echelon of writers, you yourself are going to have to put the bill of a publicist. I at Book Trope, I have my own book manager who works with me and pitches me to certain audiences for certain things, and that person also gives me advice on how to market my book. So that's the model of my current publishing company is that they have a book manager for you, but not everybody does that. Okay. What are the challenges when it comes to a person who's coming through the system and trying to publish their book? What advice will you give them what they need to do if they look in this particular route? I would say just keep an open mind and explore all the different ways there are to publish books. I mean, you can write a book proposal, pitch it to agents, or pitch it direct to publishers. That's one route. Another is to get some of these more nimble, kind of what I would call new age publishers who are trying things, trying to do things a little different. And then, of course, third, you can always self-publish. And if you know how to market yourself, that's an opportunity to not only get the book published faster, but it's also a way to take more of the revenues home when you do sell your book. So there's all different ways to do it now. And I think that's the real refreshing thing about book publishing is that there are more than one way. To, there's more than one way to do it these days. Wow. And closing, any last words that you'd like to share with our audience about your book and also where they can find it and your website? Oh, sure. Yeah. Both of my books are available now on, on pretty much any of the online, but I guess most everyone is purchasing their books on either Barnes & Noble or Amazon and the ebook is less expensive, actually, than the hardcover book. And then also, I have a blog, melindahensonneely.com. And on that blog, I write various health topics on fitness. And then I also include a lot of recipes on my blog. So I had somebody say, what? Oh, you have this book and there's no recipes in it. I'm like, yes, go to my blog and you'll get some recipes. So that's kind of a nice way to bring it all together. (laughs) Wow. We really appreciate it. Where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? You know what? I definitely want to keep writing. I have so many ideas swirling around in my head. But the other thing I really want to do is devote a certain percentage of my time to doing what I can to make the community healthier, whether it's involvement with organ nonprofit organizations or hospitals or healthcare professionals or doing health coaching. I really want to do what I can and play my part to helping others lead a healthier life. 
Well, well said. I really appreciate you coming out to the interview. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Tim. You have a good week. And have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This has been another production of the Core Business Show with Tim J.K. Thank you for listening, y'all. Man, from the South, we're going to go ahead and add that. So go ahead and download this episode on Blog Talk Radio or iTunes or Podcast or Podfeed or Podbean. It's available a lot of places. We get a lot of downloads per month. We're up to 150,000 downloads per month on these shows alone. And also, uh, you can write your review on Blog Talk Radio or we refer you to go ahead and write your reviews in iTunes so we can get some feedback. Thank you for listening, everybody. Have a great day. This is Tim Jacquet with The Core Business Show. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. For a free quote on equipment leasing and financing, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. And fill out the information to receive your free quote. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to The Core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. Thanks again for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet.